This is about Zcash governance and funding. <clears throat> and I planned this whole thing from the perspective of just a Zcasher. I'm not representing ECC in this talk. And in startups, we always say we wear multiple hats in startups because there's so many different things that need to be done and we flip flop. So um, as of now, I'm taking off my ECC hat. I'm not representing ECC. And I'm putting on my wizard hat. OK. Uh, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. I love this word of wisdom from Thomas Sowell, an economist. I'm not an economist. I'm an engineer. Uh, but I think the same thing about engineering. There are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. Everything is about trade-offs. And uh, I've tried to design what I'm talking about here to work for whatever your favorite dev fund or governance idea is. Um, it's all about trade-offs, and I tried to make this very abstract, so I'm trying not to advocate for my specific thing, although I do have one word of advice on the last slide. But uh, what I tried to do here was talk about general truths about how everything is trade-offs, and these are some of them. The Dev Fund, which was instituted by the community in 2020, came with a four-year sunset clause built into the blockchain. And the clock is ticking. And the Zcash community has already started this really uh, vigorous debate about what to do after the Dev Fund. Do without it, do it again, or change it. Uh, as far as I can see, almost all of the energy is in change it. Uh, there's a, there's a, a substantial vocal minority who want to get rid of it, and I don't think anybody has advocated for just keeping the dev fund as it is. Here's my bias. Um, I think the dev fund is awesome because I think that's what provides sustainability to the Zcash project. And I've often heard from other crypto projects that they wish they had a dev fund instead of either the volunteer-based thing that they currently have or having had an ICO back in the day or whatever other structures out there. Um, what I hear from them is that they think the dev fund is awesome. I think so too, at, a, like, at an engineering level. By the way, this is a solar punk future. Yeah, I think the dev fund is solar punk. OK, I'm going to use the Dev Fund as an example data point, but what I'm trying to get at is general truths about all possible funding and governance systems. So whatever your favorite Dev Fund replacement idea is, uh, hopefully this can be useful to you. So wh what everyone says and what it shows on the website and everything is that 80% of the funding current of the issuance of new Zcash coins goes to the miners, 8% to the Zcash community grants, 7% uh, to the electric coin company, and 5% to the Zcash foundation. And that's true in a way. Like, there's multiple true perspectives on it. So this is a, a display of it with, with nodes and lines, which is how I think of things as an engineer. And those little blue dots hanging off of the ZCG are all the other Zcash Community Grants recipients who get their money indirectly through Zcash Community Grants. But there's um, a mystery here. Zcash Community Grants was um, uh, instituted in the, the first Dev Fund community decision in so-called Zip 1014, and it said, uh, the Zcash Foundation will like administer and help, but they shouldn't uh, or mustn't in, in the zip uh, interfere with Zcash community grants decisions about what to fund and what not to fund. But there's two data points that I noticed. One was in the Zcash ambassadors program, there was this guy from Iran whose Twitter handle is Bitcoin Buddy because he made his Twitter handle before he discovered Zcash. And he was a really fervent, like eloquent Zcasher. And he said, I live under this theocratic dictatorship that allows women to be attacked in the streets, and also at the same time under this incompetent kleptocracy that is impoverishing everyone and 
destroying everyone's jobs and everyone's savings. And I want to tell my community about Zcash as an alternative. He was really motivated, and he applied for the Zcash Ambassadors Program, and he got rejected by the Zcash Community Grants. They said, no can do, no matter how good it looks. And the other data point is there were a few engineers who applied to get funding to implement new code to add to Zcash, and, but they said, my requirement is I'll, I'll hack on Zcash and write code and submit it, but I refuse to give my KYC information, like government name and home address or whatever. And they too are excluded and haven't been able to do that thing and get paid for it. In both of these cases, as far as I understand, Zcash Community Grants didn't have the option of pay, getting those people paid because Zcash Foundation wouldn't let them. And that's a mystery because the Zcash Foundation are packed, the whole organization is packed with high integrity people that uh, would never, um, hold on, let me get to the next part, would never um, like violate the community's mandate as they understood it for, for any reason. So let me give my answer to the mystery and you can uh, correct my errors shortly. Let me just first, you know, say that it's not correct that we wouldn't let them. It's that we are incorporated you're, you're under the You're preempting my talk, Jack. I know. Let me but get to the gonna, next slide. If you're going to lie about us, then I'm, I'm going to step no, up. No, no. It's, it's we, building we, uh, anticipation so I can we, reveal. We uh, are based in the United States, and we are there, therefore subject to the laws of the United States. And it is stated in Zip 1014 that we are allowed to veto grants if they would place our nonprofit status in jeopardy or if they would compromise the laws of the United States. Exactly. So please don't say that we don't let them. We are unable to do so. Right, so as I was about to say, the Zcash Foundation are super high integrity people that would never uh, violate something for like any like low quality reason, right? They're, they've never, um, benefit themselves or anything at the expense of serving their mission. So here's my answer to the mystery. Well, no, this is the next stage. The next stage is to point out that ZCG can't do these things without Zcash Foundation's approval and help, right? So, so this is an, a true view of the current Dev Fund. And uh, this is also, at the same time, a true view of the dev funds. Zcash Foundation receives 13% of all the coins issued, and the 8% subset of that, Zcash Foundation uses on behalf of Zcash, of Zcash Community Grants and re, like to implement Zcash Community Grants' decisions. Okay, so here's the answer to the main mystery that, that, that uh, Jack gave away the spoiler. There's a third view of the Dev Fund, which is also a true view, which is that Zcash Foundation as a US incorporated entity is subject to these uh, policies and rules that the various factions of the US government institute. And both of those two exceptions, which as far as I know are the only exceptions to uh, Zcash community grants having full independence are a consequence of Zcash Foundation not being able to do those things due to United States laws. So, I found out, along with most of you, or all of you, a few hours ago, that Zcash Foundation has just announced um, incorporating a subsidiary or an arm in the Cayman Islands, which might help with this, which I'm delighted to see. So, way to go, y'all. Um, So these are three views which are true in different, sort of at different layers. And one thing I was interesting, eye-opening to me when I was working on these slides is, notice that 80% of the ZEC issuance is outside of the control of the United States government. In a practical terms, the various, you know, arms and policymakers of the United States governments have 
no ability to uh, prevent miners from getting their 80% or to impose restrictions or rules on what the miners would do with their 80%. So here's a proposal. It's a metric for resilience. Uh, and it's not the be all end all of governance, it's just a metric, but I think it's a really useful way to think about certain trade offs. The metric is the number of independent and sustainable organizations. Now, from, uh, from this perspective, uh, that number is three. Independent and sustainable organizations which support Zcash. I, I don't count the miners as supporting Zcash. Um, they, they do in a way, especially the small time, like independent miners who are doing that as a way to gain Zcash for themselves. Almost all of the large commercial miners that I've ever talked about or I've ever heard from, uh, not only do they not do anything to actually support and improve Zcash, but they don't even hold Zcash. They sell it at the end of every day in order to hold Bitcoin instead. That's what I've been told. Maybe not all of them, but I've heard that from multiple ones of the big ones. So anyway, for this metric, the number of sustainable, independent organizations that are supporting Zcash, this view of the dev fund, that number is three. This view of the dev fund, that number is two. And in as much as this is the reality for certain, for certain cases, that number is currently one. Now, as a, as a security engineer, I really like thinking about failure modes. And um, there's this ineluctable trade-off between independence and accountability. Like, um, in this view, the Zcash Foundation can serve a really valuable role, which is that it can hold Zcash community grants accountable to whatever the um, requirements are on Zcash community grants. But at the same time, that means Zcash community grants is not really independent of Zcash Foundation. So uh, below the blockchain layer, you get, for any given circle, you get independence or accountability, pick one. At the blockchain level, you can have accountability by adding and removing recipients of DevFund, um, which the whole community kind of has to do in unison. Um, and so far, it has happened once with the initial DevFund in 2020. Uh, but in principle, you don't have to wait every four years. If the community rose up and insisted on changing this, they could. Um, but below the blockchain level, independence and accountability are a trade-off. So about failure modes, all circles on all graphs, in my view, are vulnerable to failure. And I've got four categories of failure. The first one is external attack. Um, we've seen this a lot. We've seen this a lot. My mic on? OK. Uh, we've seen external attack many times in the broader crypto space, like hackers and legal attacks and things like that. Um, and like Jack said in his opening, although there's a lot of good things about the United States, it's not, it's, it doesn't seem so reliable anymore that the United States government won't actually attack. Um, there, there have been more and more both actual attacks on other organizations and sort of like new laws proposed that may or may not pass that could really upend things. So external attack, it's pretty rare among failure modes, but it does happen and it could be really impactful. The next failure mode is what I call internal attack, and that's like, uh, you know, people going rogue or uh, secretly serving their own interests at the expense of what they're supposed to be doing, you know, like funneling the money to their family or whatever. And that one's really rare. Um, we've definitely seen it in the broader Wild West crypto space, um, but uh, despite all the uh, 
disagreements and conflicts I've had in uh, the Zcash world. Zcash world? Is my mic on? Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've ever seen anyone who is actively involved with Zcash that would like benefit themselves at the expense of, of the people they're supposedly serving. So I, I consider internal attack like, um, you know, corruption or, uh, you know, embezzlement or whatever is a really unlikely failure mode to worry about. But, of course, we still want to have uh, protection against that failure mode. And the next one is just underperformance. It's a sad fact that two-thirds of everyone who sets out to do anything never quite finishes. Um, just because doing stuff is hard. Um, and so we've got to work around that fact. We've got to be aware that no matter how, you know, no matter how well-intentioned and how knowledgeable and skilled someone is, there's a really good chance that when you set out to do something, it's not going to work out. You're not going to deliver. And this one's, like I say, common. So, so far we have, like, pretty uncommon but worth defending against, very uncommon in the world of Zcash in my experience, but definitely worth defending against. And then we have pretty dang common, like probably the majority of times that people try to do stuff, doesn't work out. And then the last failure mode that I want to talk about is uh, being a special interest. And I'm going to claim that this is 100%. Everyone is a special interest. Every group of people is a special interest. Every organization is a special interest. Everyone has how they grew up, who they know, what their values are, what language they speak. Nobody, can, nobody should ever claim to know the hearts of all men and be able to make decisions on behalf of all people. That's, that's claiming to be God. And so when thinking about the inherent trade-offs in any possible funding and governance structure, you have to think to yourself, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how well-informed, no matter how high integrity, every circle on this graph is going to, going to lead things in the direction that they think is right, and they're going to have blind spots that, not just blind spots, nobody can see more than 10% of, of the world. But everybody thinks that whatever they see is the whole world, basically. So everyone is always a special interest. And so this is a failure mode that I think it's especially useful because it's ubiquitous. Like, we have to design a system that can work well, that can be resilient and sustainable and make good results, even when everyone involved has limited information and their own value system and their own friends and culture and language and everything. Okay. Am I supposed to have time for questions? Can I have questions? I've got 11 minutes on my clock. Oh, wait, I'm not, I'm not quite done. All right, you guys quick, hurry and submit some more questions, or else you all get an extra coffee break. Okay. Okay, I think Whatever your favorite dev fund or governance system is, you should make it resilient against all four of these failure modes. I think it's possible. I think there's an inherent trade-off between accountability and independence. You can't have 100% of both, so you have to be thoughtful about the trade-off. And finally, I just have one solid recommendation. Don't put all your eggs into one basket. The wisdom of Thomas Sowell and the wisdom of Anonymous is what I have to offer. Thanks for listening. Okay, questions coming in from Hoover. First one, having more community privacy projects will drive user adoption. How can we fund more privacy projects to make the ecosystem more sustainable? Well, it's kind of outside the scope of my talk. I would say Zcash Community Grants Committee has been doing a really good job of that in the last year with Zcash Foundation support, I've noticed. Um, I also really like the model that Ian Sagstutter was advocating in the other room a few minutes ago about Zec Hub funding a large number of like 
tiny one-person operations. Cool. Cool. What happens if a new dev fund recipient stops doing funded work early? How long would it take to reassign their slice? That's a great question, because it's directly targeted at one of the most common failure modes. And the question is, how long would it take to reallocate their slice? That's a really good question. At most four years, uh, based on history so far, I believe, I, I think it depends on sort of how egregious the situation is and how widespread the, like, awareness is in the community. I think if the whole community got together and said, like, something over here is happening is really egregious and we all want to uh, change the consensus rules to remove or reallocate or add a layer of accountability or something, um, I think it would probably take, let's say, two months for the community to verify with each other that there's nobody else who's going to object so vociferously that it's going to trigger a chain fork, okay? So a degree of, like, consensus building. And then I think it would take three months to uh, update the software. It's a nice, simple update. And get everyone, like, a chance to upgrade before it kicks in. So I'm going to say less than half a year. And end of support is the limiting factor for that? For the that is a really team. important limiting factor, yeah. Would it be better to decide on our objectives first, then choose a model that fulfills our objectives? That's a great question. You know, I kind of I disagree. In general, yes, always, but also, to a large extent, the dev fund design that you come up with is not going to have a lot of direct impact on, like, policy. Like, should Zcash focus more on developers or more on end users? Should it focus more on the first world or the developing world? These are all valid sort of strategies. And I think the sort of dev fund structure set up is not a very effective way to get your favorite strategy supported. What's mostly going to come out of it is who the leadership is, what the the structure is of independence versus accountability. And finally, I think what's going to come out of it is uh, uh, signaling to the rest of the world whether to be bullish on Zcash or bearish on Zcash because of the way it was conducted. Okay. Um, where do you think we should aim to be in five years, and how should we get there? Where do I think we should aim to be in five years? I think... The main thing that I've been thinking about when I was doing this was resilience and sustainability. You know, there's this, uh, another strategy trade-off between, like, like the other ones I mentioned before, is the survive versus thrive strategy. Like, do you risk everything and go for the, the hockey stick takeoff like, a, like a, a Silicon Valley funded startup would do because it has nothing to lose? Or do you try to make yourself more robust against potential attacks um, so that no matter what happens, everyone can count on you still being there five years later. I probably vacillate on this throughout my life, but at the moment, I'm more in survive mode. I think Zcash is already awesome. It already provides something that nothing else provides. Um, it has awareness and, and branding and support in all these different parts of the world and parts of the industry. And if we just prove to people that they're still going to be able to count on it doing the same thing and improving gradually for the next five years, I think that will be a big win. So that's my current answer, but ask me again tomorrow. Isn't having non-US entities full of USA citizens still a US-based entity? How can we really make Zcash global and diverse? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there's, there's a legal definition, which I don't know, it probably depends on a bunch of legal details. Um, and then there's like a cultural definition, which is, um, you know, a, a big advantage of having a non-US entity aside from resilience to this kind of legal pressure is having broader perspectives and more diverse perspectives. So 
Um, I noticed that Jason McGee setting up Shielded Labs stated that uh, Shielded Labs is a Swiss legal entity, but Jason McGee is a U.S. citizen. I think he stated that he's going to recruit only non-U.S. people uh, to be the rest of the, of, the, of the board of directors of Shielded Labs. Um, and I'm reminded that the Ethereum Foundation has all of its directors are non-U.S. people. I don't know if that answered the question. Hmm. Well, I think that um, it's also worth bearing in mind that the majority of people who work at ECC and the foundation altogether, the majority of those people are based outside the United States, including mm. myself. So the actual mm -hmm. individuals that are involved are already very decentralized. It's just mm -hmm. the, the organizations that are, that, that are not. Yeah, and that's a, that's a strategic advantage for Zcash. Knowing what you know now, how would you have set up the Dev Fund four years ago? Well, thank goodness I didn't set up the Dev Fund four years ago. <laughs> uh, that was the, the most important outcome of the first Dev Fund debate in, to me personally and in my mind was that the community like waded through it and came to a consensus with minimal input for me personally, uh, or, or from ECC for that matter. Uh, but the question was, how would I set up the Dev Fund four years ago? I don't know, I actually think, um, I think constant improvement is better than perfection. Um, the initial Founders Reward was invented by Andrew Miller. Like before the Founders Reward, okay, so the Founders Reward was the first distribution of Zcash for the first four years from 2016 to 2020. Before that, there were ICOs uh, and pre-mining uh, were, were the two main funding mechanisms. And Andrew Miller suggested when we were just, Zcash was a gleam in our eyes, why not take this like 10% or 20% or whatever that you're considering allocating as an ICO and stretch it out after four, over four years? And I thought that was brilliant and I still do. So that was the founder's reward. And then the dev fund was like modeled on the founder's reward, conceived of by the community, and it explicitly excluded any further rewards to original founders. All the money should be used for funding development. So that's the dev fund. Uh, so basically, I think Zcash's governance and funding is already, has always been kind of like on the leading edge uh, of its time, and it's already really good, and that we should incrementally improve it again. So my answer is the Dev Fund from 2020 was like a perfectly great design for 2020. 